Chapter 1. The hard thing is usually the most overlooked thing. Many people think that the hard thing about running a business or working on an idea is the most obvious thing. Wrong. The hard thing is not hidden in the gigantic goal you set for your organization. Neither is it in hiring the best employees. The hard thing comes to light when you need to make a decision about who to fire or how to communicate in your organization, for example. The hard thing is hard and might not even be visible at first glance. Many business development books try to provide solutions to problems that have no solutions. There's really no recipe for building the right team or leading them to success. The hard things do not come with recipes. In this book, Ben Horowitz shares his stories of success and failure. As an entrepreneur and venture capitalist, he understands how difficult it is to build successful companies from scratch and has poured his wealth of knowledge into these chapters. The lessons in this tidbit form the backstory of the posts on Ben Horowitz's blog, and they usher you into a world of possibilities. One can only make decisions based on the knowledge they have stored already. So, have you been struggling with your business idea? Do you find it difficult to make tough decisions? Then, this summary is for you. Keep reading to find the hard thing about hard things and how to build a business when there are no easy answers. Chapter 2. There's always pressure on a leader to perform, which can make or break them. As a young CEO, Ben Horowitz felt pressure. The pressure of employees depending on him, the pressure of not being entirely sure of what he was doing, and even the pressure of being responsible for other people's money. As a consequence of this pressure, Ben Horowitz took losses extremely hard. If the company failed to make a sale, missed a deadline, or messed up on an order, it was difficult for him. He thought that everything would become worse if he shared the burden with his employees. So, Ben Horowitz always tried to project a positive, sunny demeanor whenever he had to interact with his staff. In a conversation with his brother-in-law, Carthew, Horowitz realized his mistake. At the time, Carthew worked as a telephone lineman for AT&T. Horowitz had just met Fred, a senior executive at the same company, and was excited to find out if Carthew knew him. Carthew replied, Yeah, I know Fred. He comes by about sometimes to blow a little sunshine up my ass. At that moment, Ben Horowitz knew that he'd been making a mistake with his company by being too positive. Hard things are hard because there are no easy answers or recipes. They are hard because your emotions are at odds with your logic. They are hard because you don't know the answer and you cannot ask for help without showing weakness. Ben Horowitz In his mind, Horowitz thought he was keeping everyone in high spirits by emphasizing the positive aspects of the business and ignoring the negative. But his team knew that reality was deeper than he was describing it. And not only did they see the truth for themselves, they still had to listen to him blowing sunshine up their butts at every meeting. There are three key reasons why it makes sense to be transparent about your company's problems. Trust. Without trust, there's a break in communication. More specifically, in any human interaction, communication increases as trust increases. As a company progresses, communication soon becomes its biggest challenge. If the employees trust the CEO, then communication will be vastly more efficient than if they don't. To build trust, it is vital that every piece of information is true. A CEO's ability to build trust within his organization with time is often the difference between companies that are successful and those that fail. The more brains working on the difficult problems, the better. You employed your staff for their uniqueness and problem-solving abilities. Allow them to do their work. The more they know, the better equipped they will be. Bad news travels fast, but good news travels slow. For many companies that have failed, their employees most likely knew about the fatal issues long before those issues killed the company. One might then wonder why the employees refused to say anything, even when they knew about the deadly problems. Well, if a company has a culture that discourages the spread of news, nobody will be inclined to act. In a healthy company, there's an open communication culture. Everyone shares their problems freely, and people get answers to difficult questions faster. Chapter 3. There is a right way to lay people off. Most times, when a company falls short of its financial goals, it is forced to fire some employees. The chief executive officer has to play a major role in this, and this can be quite daunting, especially if much resources and time were spent hiring them. One time, Ben Horowitz was ridiculed by his staff in a group email after his first layoff. That's how bad it can get if you don't handle it properly. If you have to let any staff go, you need to focus on the future instead of the past. You should ensure that the time frame between making the decision to fire people and implementing it is as short as possible. If you delay, it is almost certain that rumors will begin to spread. Then, employees will begin to ask questions and throw the entire company off balance. It is easy to get lost in the many explanations that make layoffs sound more positive. But you should be clear on the reason for a layoff. If you are laying people off because the company did not perform well, you should admit that. This is important because admitting failure is good for your life and will help you maintain your employees' trust. A layoff breaks trust in an organization. In order to rebuild trust, employers have to come clean. The entire management team has to be trained in preparation for a layoff. A manager should lay off their own people and shouldn't pass the task to human resources or any other department. Managers should understand that the layoff is the company's fault. They should be clear that the decision is final and they need to know all the details about benefits and support available to laid-off employees. Before implementing a layoff, the CEO must address the company. They must deliver a message that explains every possible aspect of the layoff. If the CEO does a good job, the managers will have an easier time and other employees will understand better. The people who stay will care immensely about how you treat their colleagues. 
Many of the people whom you lay off will have better relationships with the people who stay than you do. So treat them with enough respect. Bill Campbell. Chapter 4. Executives can also be fired if they perform below expectations. When you employ an executive, you paint a beautiful picture of their future in your company. Then, suddenly, you realize you have to fire them. The actual act of firing an executive can be confusing, but it doesn't have to be. The key to firing an executive in the right way lies in a four-step process. Step 1. Root Cause Analysis Of course, it is possible to fire an executive on the grounds of bad behavior or incompetence. But in this case, firing them is easy and it just shows that you probably have an inadequate hiring system. In more difficult cases, you have to fire an executive because you did something wrong. The number one step to firing an executive is finding out why you employed them in the first place. You may have made the mistake for a number of reasons. You didn't create a great job description. You hired the executive for their lack of weaknesses instead of the strengths they had. You hired an executive for a generic position. Step 2. Informing the board. Informing the board is tricky, and it is even more so if you have fired many executives before now or the executive you want to fire was recommended by a board member. Know that in any of these cases, the board will be a tad worried, and there's nothing that you can do about that. But you can either choose to make the board worried or allow an ineffective executive to continue working. Get the board to understand why you are firing the executive. Ask for their input and ensure you preserve the executive's reputation. Step 3. Preparing for the conversation. After you discover what went wrong and have notified the board, you should inform the executive as quickly as possible. Employees remember your words for a very long time, so you need to get it right. Be clear on the reasons for firing them. Use firm but kind words and have their severance package ready for them. Step 4. Preparing the company communication. After you have fired the executive, you should quickly update the company and your staff on the change. First, inform the executive's direct reports, other members of your staff, and then the rest of the company. Ensure that all these are done on the same day and make preparations for someone else to fill in for the fired executive. Chapter 5. Friendship and business can be a complicated combination. If you want to build a multinational organization, you might be making the wrong choice if you employ your old friend. If you do employ your friend and you need to demote them for some reason, you need to be smart about it. You should take other employees into consideration before your friend. Once you decide on what you want to do, breaking the news will be difficult. Your friend might feel embarrassed and betrayed. These are powerful emotions and you must be clear about your decision. Once you've decided to hire someone to fill a position higher than your friends, ensure that you're honest. Be clear with your language that you've decided. As previously discussed, use phrases like, I have decided, rather than, I think, or I'd like. By doing this, you will save everyone's time and energy. You should also admit your own lack of knowledge and make them see that it will do no good for the company if two people with little skills for experience run it. People make up a business, and they can see through lies and cover-ups. If you want your friend to stay in the company, you should be clear about that. Make them know that you want to help them develop their career. Also, appreciate all their effort and emphasize that the demotion is not the result of past performance, but future projections. The best way to do this, if appropriate, is to increase their compensation as you demote them. Doing so will let them know that they're both appreciated and valued going forward. Chapter 6. Startups need to train their staff using their methods and rules. Workers at McDonald's are trained for their positions, but people with far more complicated jobs are not. Ben Horowitz learned why startups should train their people when he worked at Netscape, an independent American computer services company. Many companies think their employees are so smart that they require no training. That's wrong. People are the most important asset to your company. A startup that is properly run knows this and places great emphasis on recruiting processes so they can build their talent base. Unfortunately, companies hardly invest more in their staff. This is wrong for so many reasons. First, training is one of the highest activities that can give staff leverage in their industry. As you train your people, they go on to implement what they learned. This only means that they'll be more productive. Without training, you won't be able to establish any basis for performance management. If you do not make expectations clear, how will you justify firing or promoting an employee? Many founders start companies with amazing ideas that are focused on solving existing problems. Then, as their company becomes successful, they find that their ideas do not look as good as they did in the past. This happens because success compels the company to hire new engineers, and then they neglect to train them. As the engineers carry out their tasks, they make many mistakes and create subpar products. An outstanding training program is both an investment in your employees and your company. Ben Horowitz decided to read exit interviews for Netscape to understand why people quit big tech companies. He found two main reasons why people leave their jobs. The hate they had for their manager and their stagnancy. When employees realize that their manager isn't helping them get better, or the company isn't investing in them, they figure they can get better options in other places. Did you know, on March 10, 2000, the Nasdaq stock market peaked at 5,048.62, more than double its value from the year before, and then fell by 10% 10 days later. Chapter 7. There are so many avenues to get the best employees. Your friend's company doesn't have to be one of them. Every good technology company needs great people to create amazing products. Great companies invest their time and money into recruiting the best talent. But what are the rules that guide hiring processes? 
Is it fine to hire someone from your friend's company? Most CEOs do not target a friend's company as a source of talent. Poaching an employee from your friend's company is an easy way to lose your friend. First, keep in mind that your friend's employees are probably extremely good or you won't want them in your company anyway. So you will either be recruiting excellent employees from your friend's company or you will be adding average people. You should not assume the people you are taking are not valuable. A good rule to follow is Ben Horowitz's reflexive principle of employee rating, which states that you shouldn't hire from any company if you would be shocked that they hired several of your employees. In order to avoid these difficult situations, some companies make use of written or unwritten policies that specify companies where it's okay to recruit from and others where approval from higher authority is needed before recruiting. With that kind of policy in place, your friend will have another chance to save their employee or to disagree prior to you hiring them. Background and referral checks are important because some people still turn out to be bad employees even after they perform well in their interviews. If it happens that you employed someone from your friend's company already, the best way to deal with the situation is openly and transparently. Once you become aware of the conflict between hiring a talented employee and betraying your valued friend, you should inform the employee that you have an important business relationship with their existing company and you will have to complete a reference check with the CEO prior to extending the offer. If they object, let them know that you will stop the hiring process and keep it confidential. If you speak with your friend before employing a staff member from their company, you will be able to make better conclusions. Chapter 8. You don't have to know every single thing to hire executives in your company. The biggest difference between being a great manager and being a great general manager, and particularly a great CEO, is that as a general manager, you might have to employ and train people who know their jobs more than you do. You might have to hire and manage people to do jobs that you have never attempted. If you're confused about how you can hire someone good, even when you know nothing about their field, you should follow these steps. Know what you want. This is the most important step in the hiring process and the one that gets skipped most often. If you don't know what you want, the chances that you'll get it are extremely low. Tony Robbins You must understand that you don't know much about many topics and resist the urge to educate yourself during interviews. The interview process can be quite educational, but using that as your sole information source is dangerous. Ensure you don't hire because the applicant looks and feels ready for the job. Also, do not hire them because of their many strengths alone. Run a process that figures out the right match. For you to find the right executive, you must take the knowledge that you have gathered over the hiring period and convert it into a process that produces the right candidate. Write down the strengths you desire and the weaknesses that you are willing to accept. Develop some questions based on the criteria. Assemble an interview team and check for many references. If there is a hiring system in place, it is easier to measure parameters and choose worthy candidates for a job position. Make a lonely decision. Despite many people being involved in the hiring process, the final decision should be made by the CEO. Take several calm moments to study the criteria, references, and other information. Sometimes you just need to follow your instincts. Conclusion. If you run a company, you will experience extreme psychological pressure to be overly positive. Stand up to the pressure, face your fear, and tell the truth. Every CEO likes to say they run a great company. It's hard to tell whether the claim is true until the company or the CEO has to do something really difficult. Perhaps the hardest thing a CEO will have to do is take care of themselves. Sometimes the company fails and things get out of control. It is not the end of the world. As your organization grows, people expect you to do better, manage more people, and push out more products. But you cannot do everything on your own. Learn not to take the things that people say or do personally, but care enough to make a change when it's necessary. Make new friends and focus on your journey. There are many mistakes in the future. This is a sign of growth. Embrace your journey and keep doing the hard things one by one. You're capable of leading your company to success. Try this. Set up an interview team for your company's next set of interviews. Also, consult external training companies and select courses that your employees can benefit from. You can also ask for their input so you'll know what exactly they need.